Let me begin by, by introducing Joanne Lippmann. Um, she has achieved great success in the, in, in the world of publishing, uh, beginning as a reporter uh, at the Wall Street Journal, um, on to being an entrepreneur uh, at the Wall Street Journal in, in Condé Nast in starting new editorial properties uh, within those organizations. Uh, she moved on to Gannett, where she ultimately became editor-in-chief of USA Today and the chief content officer um, of, of, of Gannett overall. So uh, also, interestingly, I had the, the, the tremendous pleasure of getting to know Joanne over the last uh, year and a half um, as we were both members of the, uh, of, of the Knight Commission on Trust, Media, and Democracy. Um, and we're, frankly, at the latter stages of completing that work, and we'll publish a report sometime in the next few months, um, which simply to me says that Joanne is obviously not shy about taking on very challenging questions. Uh, so, you know, what's the future of gender equality in the workplace? What's the future of democracy in the world of the Internet? Uh, these are vexing problems, uh, and um, they don't as we know, have necessarily simple solutions. They have constructive approaches, but not necessarily simple solutions. So we're here to talk about, uh, about Joanne's book. By the way, there, there will be, we do have several dozen uh, copies available. Uh, it is available also on Kindle of her book. That's what she said, uh, what men need to know and women need to tell them about working together. So uh, let me just open up by saying that you know, these are, as we know, very challenging times for our society in, in many, many ways. Um, these are also very challenging times at Google, um, as we well know. And this last hour is ample evidence of that, uh, of the work we need to do, um, of the justifiable concerns that many of us have about the urgency in addressing these challenges. And I hope today, uh, and I get verklempt, I hope today, an indication of our, of our cultural commitment to addressing them. Um, and again, it's, it, it's not over in a day, uh, but I do think there's symbolism um, uh, uh, to what happened today and, and hopefully symbolism that has long value. Uh, I might come back to that later. So let's, let's get into this. Uh, Joanne, I, I think your book, and I'd strongly urge you to read it, it's filled uh, with... with uh, Tremendous amount of information, um, examples, data uh, about the environment we're in. Uh, and, and Joanne does an excellent job of, of illuminating those issues of unconscious bias, um, of how women feel in the workplace, uh, of how they're often perceived in the workplace in ways that we know they should not be perceived. Um, uh, and as typical with these sessions, I will, after uh, the first two or three or so, open it up to all questions. Um, but I, 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 let me start off uh, with a few. And I, I, I want to, your book makes, I think, a really important point that in addressing these issues, it's how do we take constructive approaches? Um, how do we look more at the do's than the don'ts? Um, and I think we'll come back to that several times in this conversation. So let me just start off, um, you know, based on your work, based on even what you might know at a fairly high level about Google, what are the, what are the several things that you would advise Google, advise Googlers, uh, male or female, in, in guiding that evolution of a, of a gender equal culture? Sure, so first of all, thank you guys for having me and thank you for having me today of all days. So um, I was actually got here just as the walkout was happening so I got to be a part of it and I, and I was so energized by it and I also, uh, I've been following Google Walkout um, on Twitter. Um, watching this, this cascade around the world, which is amazing to see. But what I loved being outside with all you guys was how many men I saw and how many how, male allies and, and knowing Googlers like Richard. Um, and that is actually why I wrote That's What She Said. And, and actually, the reason that I wrote the book in the first place is because I, I grew up, you know, my first two decades of my career, I spent at the Wall Street Journal 
where almost all of my colleagues were men, my sources were men, uh, my mentors were all men, and I had a very good experience in a very male-dominated organization in a male-dominated industry. And, um, and yet, as I rose up the leadership ranks, I started getting invited to more and more of these women's leadership conferences. <laughs> and um, at a certain point, I just became a little bit frustrated because these conversations were phenomenal. Women's conversations with one another. When we talk amongst ourselves, we talk all the time about the issues we face at work. And I don't mean just the, the extremes of sexual abuse but the everyday things of being marginalized and overlooked, interrupted, not taken seriously, not taken as seriously as the guy next to us. And we talk about it all the time with each other, but men are not part of that conversation. And, um, and so I actually, the book grew out of a piece I ended up writing for the Wall Street Journal called Women at Work, A Guide for Men, and in which I say, and this is the, the point of the book, women talking to each other, it's a great conversation, it's half a conversation. And the only way we're going to get, you know, we're going to, that gets us to half a solution. So the only way we solve this is for us to all understand we need to work together and bring men into the conversation. So at a high level, that's the most important thing. That was amazing to see that today. I also love seeing men here, which is great. Um, and, and I love being invited here. Um, I've been talking to a lot of male dominated organizations. Um, you know, uh, there are so many things that we can talk about, and I, I actually have a cheat sheet in the back of the book on 10 things you can do right now to close the gender gap, but there, it really breaks down into things that individuals can do and things that organizations can do. And just to talk for a moment organizationally, because I do think a lot of the things that were on those five changes actually mirror things that I recommend in the book. Um, I, I, uh, things like a gender wage gap analysis that is transparent, I think is very, very important. There's a law now in the UK that just went into effect that companies must report their gender wage gap analysis. And would anyone like to take a guess of how many companies in the UK pay women more than they pay men? Zero, Zero exactly. Zero. Well, it's really important to know that information so that you can act on that information. Um, there are companies as well that actually in, um, build it into compensation to incentivize not just hiring, but training, recruitment, promotion, and retaining diverse talent. Not just women, but all diverse talent. I think that, that that's very helpful. Um, and then there are things that, that we as individuals can do. But the, the bottom line for organizations is it really it must come from leadership. This is something I've learned. I've been traveling around the country. And I think the frustration that led to the walkout today was a frustration in that it's not that you know there's thousands of women who have walked out. We don't, it's not like thousands of women have been sexually abused at work. But I think it's, it's the signal that that sends. When you have some bad behavior at the top, the, the signal that it sends to the rest of the organization and through the culture is that if, if you have that kind of behavior at the top, then what does that say about how we value women in the rest of the organization? And that translates into things like respect, which there's a huge respect gap between men and women that has been documented in the research. Um, and it's those kinds of things that I think that we really, individually, we all can address. Well, as you point out often, uh, role modeling is key. Absolutely. And, and awareness is key. I mean, I talk a lot about unconscious bias. When you read the book, there's actually a chapter focused on Google and its efforts to combat unconscious bias. And I spent time with a fabulous unconscious bias expert in your New York office, Brian Welly, who's absolutely spectacular, great researcher. Um, but I think that the question really uh, in unconscious bias is it's so important. You have to be aware of it all the time. And I know you guys have unconscious bias trainings. Um, but a couple of hours of training does not transform a culture. And so there's so many things that, um, that we need to be aware of just in, in everyday life. Um, unconscious bias, I'm sure you all know what it is because you've all been trained, right? It's the biases we have that are buried so deep inside of us, we don't even realize they exist. And we all have them, men, women, black, white, no matter what, we all have them. Um, and Effectively about our tribes, in, in, in a sense, it, our sense of tribalism. It is, it is. And so we don't always, we're not always aware of how that, how that impacts us. <clears throat> but, but just as a couple of, for instances, um, you know, women, it turns out women are interrupted three times more frequently than men. 
the Northwestern actually did a study of the Supreme Court of the United States and found that the female Supreme Court justices are interrupted three times more frequently than male Supreme Court justices. Um, another thing that, that probably every woman here has experienced um, is uh, that thing that happens when you're in a room, generally if women are in a minority in a group, in a meeting, which has certainly happened to me many times, and most of you probably, um, it is true, your voices aren't heard. Um, it, there's this research shows that if you make up 30% or less of a room, um, the women's voices are, they're, they're literally, like the, the ear is tuned to the male voices in the room. So um, how many women here have had that experience, right, where you say something in a meeting, and it's like, Nobody heard it, crickets, right? And then two minutes later, a guy repeats exactly what you just said, and everybody turns to him. They're like, Dave, great idea you had, Dave. Right, well, that, I, that's happened to me a million times, and I used to think it was just me. But it turns out it is in the research. That is actually something that is very common to almost all women. Uh, you, know, you, you mentioned... Um training, unconscious bias training. One of the things that I was surprised to learn from the book uh, was uh, the research that tells us that diversity training doesn't work and that it's in fact counterproductive. Um, you know, it felt counterintuitive to me, but, but also, as you went into it, wise. Um, and so it, I think it'd be great for you to explain, like, why is that the case? And, and, and more importantly, what do you think that tells us about how we guide our workforce in, in building a gender equal culture? Yeah, yeah, so there's actually research, a Harvard professor by the name of Frank Dobbins did this research where he looked at, and this was at uh, traditional um, diversity training. So he looked at 30 years of diversity training at more than 800 companies. And he found that for two groups, for women as well as for black men and women, that not only did it not work, it actually made things worse for those two groups. In other words, those companies, those two groups would have fared better in those companies had there been no training at all. And he delved into the reasons for this, and there were a variety of reasons. Um, but one of them was that um, it, it was resentment on the part of the primarily white men who were subject to the training. So I went back and found some of these traditional trainers, and one of them actually said to me, look, when we started diversity training about 30 years ago, um, it was in response to lawsuits. And he said, and, and our process basically was beating white guys over the head with a two by four and trying to make them feel guilty. And he said, and if they cried, even better. So, the, 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 it, you know, it had exactly the reverse of the intended effect. That actually has engendered and led to the rise of unconscious bias training, because the idea with unconscious bias training is we all have it. We're not trying to make you feel guilty about it. We're just trying to help you interrupt it. Um, but I think the issue with unconscious bias training, you, you still do have people, including uh, you had a situation here at Google as well. You do have people who still feel like they're getting beaten up. Um, but I think the larger issue really is simply unconscious bias training is not in and of itself a fix. It is a piece of a culture. And, and that culture really is, that, that's what we really need is a cultural overhaul. And that's, that's not specific to Google. This is, this is our corporate life in this country really needs to have an overhaul in how we interact with one another. You know, I, I... I can't help but think there's, there's, I mean, there's something I think very deep in that. I mean, you mentioned, for instance, just the dynamics of how we guide, uh, irrespective of this issue, of how we give criticism to people, say, in performance reviews. In your case, in one of the things you mentioned, in, in some, in also in terms of being too shy about giving harsh guidance. But to me, the, I think the larger lesson is that is, um, which I think we learn in all kinds of ways in terms of parenting, is like it's always so much better to give an individual guidance to how they can succeed and assume they will succeed rather than telling them about all the things they've done wrong and assuming they will continue to do it wrong. 
Right. Yeah. I would totally agree with that. I would add in there is some research that shows us some of the um, biases that creep into performance reviews. So um, one actually is, um, and this this stunned me actually. So I the, for the, in in writing the book, I traveled around the country and the and the world, seeking out primarily men in positions of authority who are trying to close the gender gap. And the first question, because I wanted to learn from them, you know, what are the strategies? Like, what are success stories and strategies that we can all learn from? But one of the, the first question I would always ask them is, tell me what perplexes or frustrates you about the women who you work with. And I was stunned by how many of these men said, I'm afraid she'll cry. Now, it is actually true that younger women do cry, biologically speaking, more than older men. But the interesting thing is these men were afraid that they would unintentionally say something to a subordinate female and unintentionally hurt her feelings. But here's the thing. The research tells us, and actually any woman in this room will also tell us, that when a woman does cry at work, it is not because her feelings are hurt. It is because she's pissed off. She's furious. A woman crying at work is actually pretty much the same thing as a man yelling right. at work. But these executive men, it has a serious consequence, which is actually Catalyst did this survey of executive men and said, what might stand in the way of you um, uh, supporting gender equality at work? And uh, something like, it was more than 70% of them, I think it was 74% of them cited fear. And Part of the fear was you know, fear of loss of status, particularly among other men. But part of the fear was fear of saying the wrong thing. And, and what that led to, and other research has shown this, is that these men who were in positions of authority are afraid to give candid feedback to women in the way that they give it to men. And what that results in is women getting many more of these um, um, evaluations that talk about their personality. Um, and often have a personality critique. You know, she's abrasive or brash or aggressive in a bad way, um, versus men who tend to get very constructive, performance-oriented critiques. And again, that's another thing. It's very subtle, but what that ends up doing is giving men more of the information they need to succeed, and the women arenren't getting it. In, 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 again, so many insights about unconscious bias into our cultural biases. Um, into stereotypical models of male behavior, stereotypical models of societal behavior, for that matter. And like you mentioned in the book that you wear high heels uh, to, in a sense, put yourself closer on a more equal footing, which uh, interestingly resonated with me in that I, uh, I'm not a particularly tall guy. I've, I've raised a lot of money from venture capital firms, and the, the end of that process is always you presenting to the full partnership at their Monday meeting. And these are, talk about macho, ego-driven rooms. Uh, it's like way up there. And the ethos in VC firms is, it's, yeah, the idea is one thing, but it's all about the CEO um, in, in a pretty extreme way. And when I would go into those presentations, I would literally sort of puff myself up I would stand several inches taller. I would get closer to people. I'd use my arms. I'd speak more loudly um, you know, to kind of present myself in the way they were expecting to see me. Um, and I think there are obvious techniques that work for all, but I couldn't help in thinking about that saying, in fact, my wife, by the way, she jokes, she's like, you're the only 5'9 guy who thinks he's 6'2. <laughs> But I thought you were 16. <laughs> see, but is that, is that, are we playing into patriarchal models with that? I mean, to what extent is it about patriarchal models or is it about societal models? And how does that matter to what we're talking about? Yeah, look, I mean, we, it would be great for us to be able to wipe out all of these um, kinds of concerns like, like that, right? It would be terrific. But until then, there are strategies. And, and what you experienced is what women experience every day and often many times a day. So, um, so I actually, in the, in the research, so I do wear high heels every day, and I always thought it was because I worked around men and I wanted to have a physically larger presence. But it turns out that taller women earn 8% more than shorter women. Women who wear makeup earn more than those who do not. Women who are thin out earn those who are heavy. 
and people generally, men and women, who are better looking, and earn taller. more, and taller, earn CEOs more. in height is a fascinating. Yep, it is an actual, it's a thing. It's a real yeah. thing. Um, but for women, grooming actually counts much more. And there was this great calculation. Deborah Spar, who was the president of Barnard, calculated that over the course of her career, a professional woman will spend a total of five full years longer than her male spouse or colleague getting ready for work. Like the hair, the makeup, the, you know, just maintenance. And which I found fascinating, but again, it's, it's the, the, the world that we live in, and, and, and including Google, I mean, the, the work world that we live in was created by men for men. And so women are, in a, in a sense, trying every day. There's a thousand things we do, some conscious, some unconscious, to try and fit into the world created by men. And a huge reason why I wrote that's what she said was to make men aware, I actually geared the book toward men, even though, I mean, it's for women as well, obviously. But I really want to bring men in to understand what some of these issues are, just so that they have an awareness of it. Because you know, women are leaning in so far, we're falling over. Um, but the men who I spoke to were awesome. And these are guys who realize that they, they, they have to reach out as well. It's not just a one-sided thing. And I, think, I do think that there's been a little bit of a too much of an onus put on women, uh, particularly in these past few years, that it's all on us. You know, we have to demand to be paid what we're worth. We have to go out there and, 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 and um, you know, fix the patriarchy. Uh, but in fact, it actually, this is a two-sided equation. And we need the men to, to recognize that as well and join us. I'm going to uh, move to the audience. Um, there's a question on the dory um, that I think relates to what we're talking about here. Uh, um, this person says, you have talked about differences in the ways that women and men typically present their thoughts, suggestions versus declarations. Uh, not all men and women present in the typical way. How much of the lack of respect for those approaches do you attribute to the approach itself, the technique, versus speaker's gender? Yeah, that's a great question. And the first thing I would say is that, so, so it is documented that women do use more hedging language than men do. And that would be things like, I hate to bother you, but, you know, this might be a stupid question, but um, we use more upspeak, like when we ask a question, when we mean a statement, um, and we apologize all the time, and we are not sorry. Uh, but we but we use that verbal tick, and we're highly aware of these verbal ticks, and we try like crazy to to counteract them. But the other thing I will say is I've heard from so many readers of that what she said, who are because all of this applies not just to women, but to pretty much anyone who's in an underrepresented group. Um, and so much of the research I cite also deals not just with women but with underrepresented groups. And one of the groups of people of readers who that I have heard a lot from is introverted men, who say. All of these behaviors are my behaviors as well, and I suffer from the same consequences. So I think it's, it's relevant, um, highly relevant. And, and that's why it's so important to be aware of it, because it, it, right now, it is the norm of behavior. And women have spent many years trying to fit that norm. And what we need to do is have men be aware, and women, all of us, kind of be aware of these different communication styles and just be more yeah, sensitive to I, I want to be specific to that. And I'm going to take the next question from the room. So, so get your thoughts together. A um, couple of things there. You, know, you mentioned in the book about uh, you, uh, how important mentoring is. Uh, you mentioned how uh, often senior men are uncomfortable, concerned about perceptions in uh, mentoring younger women, which frankly I kind of think is a cop-out. Um, I think if we can't as professionals figure out how to manage that dynamic, then you know probably you shouldn't be doing what you're doing. Uh, but let's put that aside. Um, in, in my own experience, uh, I particularly in my more advanced stage, as it were, meaning I'm old, um, um, I, I do enjoy, uh, one of my great pleasures at Google is, is trying to coach uh, people. I say try, I don't know how good at it I am, but, but, but I've also sensed that in this engineering-centric culture, um, uh, it's not just about men and women. I mean, it's not just about women in this regard, um, that uh, there are many folks here who are, who are introverted, not self-assertive. Um, uh, but the question I have for you is, is 
I mean, today, and I try to coach women in pretty much the same way as I coach men. Um, but are there different approaches that one should take place, or is it just about different sensitivities? So first of all, I 100% agree with you about being a cop out. There's a, there are men out there who say, oh, I, you know, me too. I can't. I'm never going to talk to a woman. I can't mentor a woman. Um, and that's just bullshit. Sorry. I have no patience for that. That's generally men who aren't mentoring women anyway. Um, but there are many, many different ways to mentor. And I think that the, the big difference is and that, we, that we, uh, we know from the research that women tend to have mentors who give them advice. Men tend to have what are known as sponsors who can get them promotions. And so actually, the, that Harvard research I mentioned earlier, Frank Dobbin, when he was looking at what are solutions that work versus the old-fashioned diversity training, one of them was formal mentorship programs. And the, the idea with a formal mentorship program is it's not that I am mentoring Susan because she's a woman. It is because I am mentoring whoever it is because they are in my field. And very often what ends up happening is senior women end up being paired with or, or sought out by other women, um, but they're not in the same field. They can't help. Right, and it's it's you know it's not gender mentoring gender. It is you want you want to be mentored by somebody who can actually help you advance. And I think that's the that's the big big difference. Is there a question in the room? Uh, <laughs> I think is this yeah it's on. Um, I think what you're saying is so interesting because when I look back over the course of my career, no one has done more for me in my career than white men, right? And I, I work with so many women, and I offer my mentorship to them and, and sponsorship in, in certain cases as well. And what I often hear is, is like, there's just not enough females in leadership positions, so I just don't have any mentors. I don't have any sponsors. And you know, my thought there is, is like, it doesn't have to be a woman. Like, right. look to these men because they are in the positions of power, and they will do a lot for you. And I wonder if it's sort of there's an oversaturation of just like these these men don't have enough time to. You know, there's few of them, I would say, who are um, as connected to sort of women in the way that the women want them to be. And I'm wondering, you know, how do we? What can we do to enable more men to understand how women need to be mentored and what they expect from sponsorships? Because so much of it comes back to your point around women in a lot of underrepresented groups actually don't get the critical skill-based feedback that they need. They're not getting skill-based mentorship. And that continues the vicious cycle of people not sort of understanding what really needs to happen because there's a fear of hurting feelings or that sensitivity. So uh, is that? Yes, you made a great point, and and um, and that actually, the, what you're talking about is why this Harvard professor said these formal programs are actually more effective. And in fact, um, there are a couple of organizations uh, that I cite in the book that that put into effect these formal programs, and they found that it helped with retention and promotion, not just of the people who were being mentored, but it helped with retention of the people who were doing the mentoring, yeah. which is also really interesting. Um, but yes, I think we have to, we have to think about that skills-based mentoring. We, we have a tendency, all of us as humans, to gravitate toward people who remind us of ourselves, and that has been a huge issue. Um, one, of the, one of the solutions, one of the things that, of, of my recommendations, and that's what she said, um, is to have a, a Rooney rule. So you, you guys know what the Rooney rule is? If in, it's in football. If you have a, an opening, you need to have a diverse slate of candidates to choose from. But what I'm recommending and what I learned from the men who I interviewed was that's not enough. You actually need to have a diversity of people who are doing the interviewing. And that goes to whether they are thinking about looking at somebody to be promoted or filling an opening. You need a diverse slate of people. Because if you've got a bunch of white guys who are evaluating a diverse group of people, you still do not get an optimal result. And, and, and the other thing I will say is so many companies that I visit with say, oh, we really want women in our senior ranks, but we can't find any. And to them, I say, and to Google, I say, look in your junior ranks. Look, what do, what's happening there? Right? What, look at who are the people who are coming in. Look at every single level, especially in those low, lower levels leading to middle management. Look at every level and see who are you promoting and who are you not? Who are you losing and who are you not? Because there's leakage in there, and there's people who are being passed over 
who, um, who should not be. Um, and I think that that, and, and it doesn't, if you do that, it's not going to take you that long until you've grown your own leaders. Um, I, I actually, I had a, um, so I spoke at a consulting, big, one of the big consulting firms, and I had dinner afterward with a table of 10 senior women at this consulting firm. And they went around the table, and all of them had been recruited by other major consulting firms. And because they were already at a senior level. And that's the problem. If we're just shuffling around the same too few women at the top, we are not going to get anywhere. right? I spoke to a bank that, um, that before I went, I did a little bit of research. And I found that they had made a commitment to gender equality in 1982. <laughs> I'm speaking to her room. I said, most of you guys here were not born in 1982. You have plenty of time to get yourself to gender equality. But they're losing the women on the way up, and they're not growing their own leaders. And I think that is so essential. Not enough companies are focused on that. Yeah, I, I think that's so true. And, and by the way, one other thing, I think, again, on, on, on trying to facilitate mentoring and mentoring programs, um, one thing I, I, I feel also important to recognize is, is to encourage people, um, encourage people to ask someone for mentoring. Um, uh, you know, not be shy about that. I mean, when you think about it, it's actually kind of a nice ego inflating thing if someone says and says, hey, "Can you help me?" Like you know more than I do. You've been around the track a few more times. Um, that uh, it's it's you know, that's a, that's a very simple path if you can be comfortable doing that. So that's the key, is if you can be comfortable. I mean, yes, I agree that's a great idea. But I think, again, it puts the onus sure. on the person with less power. And we've, we put too much onus already on the people with less power. We need to put more on the people with power. And in fact, while I was writing the book, and I was at Gannett, and it actually changed the way I manage. And I started realizing that when we had openings, and especially like with internal openings, I'd have all these guys who would put their hands up for it, but there would be women or, or minority you know, can, people of color who were not putting their hands up who should, would have been very qualified in the pool. So I took it on myself to say, because I was in the middle of this research, I was like, wait a second. So I would like actually go into the newsroom and, and talk to people and bring them into my office and say, hey, I see you didn't put your hand up. You should know that you were qualified to be in this pool. Doesn't mean that you would get the job. And I'm not telling you you have to right. put your hat in. But you should know that. And if you're not interested, let's talk about what you might be interested in down the line. And I realized, belatedly, I think, that it was really my responsibility as a leader to go out and, and make sure that these people who have talent are given these opportunities. And it shouldn't always be on their head. Excellent point. I'm going to move to our virtual. Oh, we have an unvirtual audience right here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, sometimes at an individual level, we will see managers behaving in ways that are not as egregious as firing, but still are kind of leading to outcomes that decrease diversity. Mm -hmm. And I have thought about speaking up many a time, and I've had male mentors for me who cared about me personally, who advised me not to speak up, that it would hurt my career. And one of the few times that I did choose to do that, suddenly I, I did feel some, some pretty bad consequences. So what is your advice to people who are seeing things that are in the gray area. Yeah. Should they actually, what kinds of actions are actually productive? Because I haven't figured it out. Yeah, I, this is where allyship is so important. I mean, what you're talking about is so common in all organizations. Um, and this, is, I talk a lot about different kinds of allies, women with women or with men. Um, but that's what's so important. I mean, I think one of the issues, particularly that women face, is particularly if this behavior is directed at them, and 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 maybe it it doesn't rise to the level of firing, but it is demeaning, perhaps, or or, or dismissive. 
Um, and the women feel like, ugh, I got to figure out how to deal with this. And that's where allies come in. Um, in. In the case that you're talking about, I would have hoped that the mentors would have, would have they would have stepped up and, and intervened. And that's, that's the kind of behavior that we want to encourage, the, that kind of allyship. And I, and I tell people that your ally can be somebody at your level. It can be somebody in a different department. I have found in different organizations, sometimes I have been approached by somebody who doesn't report to me, who's not in my department, to tell me about some sort of um, behavioral issues with a manager. And it's really important to do that. And one of the reasons it's important is because I can say almost every time, maybe every time that has ever happened to me where I've been approached about, with somebody says, I don't want to bring it up to my boss, but almost always the person they're talking about has a history of bad behavior. And they, so you need to surface that so that the person can be either talked to, disciplined, dismissed, whatever, whatever the, the correct course of action is. Too often we, we stay quiet. And that's why it's important to have that ally. And I'm sure, Richard, you've probably had this situation too. People, you know, you're, you're like, you're one of the good guys, right? So I can imagine somebody coming to you and confiding in you but I would imagine you wouldn't tell them to be quiet. You would try and. No, I mean, and I, you know, I can't say as I know always what the perfect techniques are. But I, yes, in many of those circumstances, I mean, it's understandable that that that, that the individual construct, confronting the manager is not likely to achieve the best result in both ways, for that matter, and end up with a consequence you don't like, which is why you know you'd like to think that that organizations would have people and mechanisms to address that. Because in that context, um, you know, depending on the circumstance, yeah, there are ways to address that. And there are ways to address that without the individual being, in a sense, brought into the equation. Right. right. You, you know, I can give it's you bad behavior. It, it, uh, you know, it's, it, it, I don't have to declare who complained. Uh, there, you know, if you, there are lots of clever ways to deal with that, I think, if you, if, if you try. I can mention actually two quick ones because um, these both worked in real life. So one was uh, I was talking to a senior executive while I was out on book tour, and the senior executive, big consumer products company, um, came up to me to, to tell me, he said he had a team, senior team, and he said there was a woman on his team, and she was like a real ball buster. She was great. Like, he didn't worry about her. But she came to him privately and said, hey, have you noticed that when we are in our meetings, there's this particular guy who every time I open my mouth, he shuts me down or cuts me off or takes credit for my idea? And this boss said, actually, I had not noticed. But once I did, we made, he said, we made a secret pact. And the secret pact was I was going to be on the lookout for that behavior. And every time I saw it, I was going to intervene and back her up. And he wouldn't have known had she not mentioned that. And one other example, which happened with me, was somebody not in my department came to me um, at an organization and, and said, I don't want to complain to my own boss, but there's a particular guy who is, is dismissive. And I know another woman who quit because the, the way he, they, she didn't like the way he treated him. But it's not like he's hitting on us or anything like that. It's just dismissive behavior. So I actually went to um, a friend in HR. And the friend said, I'm so glad you came to me because that particular guy has a record. I didn't know that. Um, but that's why it's so important. Like They needed this information. They needed to know this information so that they could take the proper action. And so, I mean, in some cases, what I've done, and I, you know, again, it so much depends on the circumstance, is in providing that feedback to the individual, is you sort of like multiply it, right? And say, like, I'm getting feedback. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, and it's not necessarily singular if you're getting feedback. Yep. Uh, and obviously, that doesn't work in all circumstances. And I get that. I don't. I, I think one of the last ones was like, you know, Richard, you use a lot of foul language. Uh, you know, some people are uncomfortable with that. And I see some people <laughs> I work with laughing. <laughs> I haven't yet mastered the solution to that, um, but I'm trying. Question um, over here. Hi. Hi. Um, so I have a question um, about. When working towards closing the gender gap, how do we make sure that people that don't identify as like gender binary fall through the cracks? That's a great question. The, the, and I make a, a real effort in, that's what she said, to look at research that is, it, the book itself is gender, but I make a real effort to look at underrepresented groups. And I think what you're talking about, people that you're talking about fall into the category of underrepresented groups. And, and that, it, it, if you're talking about people who are not gender binary, 
um, people who are, or people who fall into other, you know, religious minority. I mean, there are there are there are a lot of people who, unfortunately, um, experience these same issues. And I think a lot of the same strategies hold. And I was very cognizant of that as I put together the, the cheat sheet um, at the end of the book for you know, recommendations of things we can do. And I'm actually working, as we speak, on updating the book for paperback to, to look separately for individuals, steps we can take, and organizations, steps that organizations should be taking. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go to our virtual audience. Um, how much of a company's actions are attributed to it being self-serving? A quote I've heard is that human resources will help someone as long as it doesn't go against the interest of the company. Yeah, so I think that your allies, when I'm talking about allyship, is not necessarily HR. HR does have a role in protecting the company. Um, I, I, what, I, what I strongly feel is the best way to overhaul the culture, and it really does have to start with the leadership. The leadership has to not just talk the talk, but they have to walk the walk. They have to model the behavior, and, um, and they have to, sh you know, and I, I also think in, that um, um, incentives need to be modeled as well to incentivize the right kinds of behaviors. We all react according to incentives, and if our incentives um, have nothing to do with kind of the, the, the inclusion and diversity, then we're not going to pay attention to it. And I've met some amazing DNI professionals in my travels, but they alone cannot change a culture. Really, only the leadership can do that. I, I wanna, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to probe you to add a little bit more to that, because it's obviously, it's, 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 abs it's absolutely true that companies operate out of self-interest. I mean, they should. It's the, the nature of... Uh, of its existence, uh, you know, rewarding its shareholders, so on and so forth. T to me, the, the 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 objective, indeed, the opportunity is: how do you guide that to be more self enlightened, uh, or uh, in enlightened self interest? Is what I'm trying to say. And you talk a lot in the book about examples of how companies are stronger when they have uh, gender diversity, how they design better products uh, yes. when they have gender diversity. So to me, that's the enlightened self-interest. Um, you know, how do you uh, build a talented workforce? Absolutely, absolutely. So every piece of research shows you, and you've probably heard some of this, that a gender-balanced leadership and a gender-balanced organization is actually more successful by every financial measure. And that goes for your board of directors, you know, companies that have the most women on boards are more financially successful than those with the least. Companies with gender-balanced leadership outperform those without by a factor of, you know, like a double-digit percentage. Um, in terms of return on equity, but also work groups. Gender balanced work groups are better at problem solving. They're more creative when it comes to solutions. There was even this research that showed that they are more accurate in solving a murder. Um, there was this research where they, they had two, that is all male, all female, and mixed gender group, and they gave them a real life murder case to solve. And um, the, both single sex groups had so much fun with this exercise, and they agreed very quickly on who the culprit was, and they were very confident of the result. The mixed gender group took longer, it was less fun, there was more back and forth, they were less confident of the result, but guess who was right? They were right, they were right, because you need that input from a variety of perspectives to really come to your ultimate best solution. So another question uh, uh, from the audience. While Google strives for diversity, it can be a challenge when rank and file managers do not value diversity of opinions or recognize employees who approach problems from a different perspective. How can that be managed? Now, actually, this kind of hits home with me because this is something where I feel I often have to kind of remind myself to um, uh, engender multiple opinions and frankly, break through my own thinking. I mean, I think there's this interesting psychological element that as any of us become more confident in what we do, um, more confident in whether it's leadership skills or our knowledge, you also inherently kind of start to close your mind a little bit. And, and it takes effort to break through. And yeah. I, I don't feel like I've mastered that at all. Yeah, I think that that is a great point, and the the um, that's part of the diversity. That that's part of the awareness factor. Mm -hmm. I mean, being aware that you 
tend to like, you know, I, I've been in organizations where they say, oh, the boss really likes brassy women. Well, what if you're a quiet woman, right? Uh, you know, the, the, you, you really have to check yourself. And again, I do think that um, this is an issue that we see a lot of in companies where you have sort of enlightened leadership, particularly in big companies. Enlightened leadership, but then you hear, you know what, it's not trickling down. I have a manager who doesn't value what the company is valuing in terms of diversity of opinion, diversity of, of, of approach. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think, again, that is why it's so, that's why I think our, our, we have these in, in, intractable cultural issues, um, which is what leads to things like today, where we had you know, thousands of people um, on the walkout, in the walkout. Um, but ultimately, sometimes that's what you need to move the needle to actually affect change. At the beginning of the talk, you mentioned that women-only leadership trainings and conversations can be so valuable for that audience. You also mentioned the statistic about um, women getting interrupted in mixed company and also diversity training backfiring. So I wonder, how do you recommend that we bridge those divides besides just sort of waiting for male allies to self-identify and proactively approach the group in order to learn more about the women's perspective. Right. So I actually advise women's ERGs, employee resource groups, to invite men. You don't have to invite them all the time, but there's a great example of a, of a firm um, where um, uh, I heard it was a very male-dominated company, and they had a women's meeting. It's not, not a company as big as Google. So they had all women's meeting for all of their North America operations. And they decided we're going to have just a women's meeting. And then the few senior women said, you know what? For a portion of this meeting, we're each going to invite a senior man. And it turned out that those invitations were so coveted that all the senior men were like lobbying to get invited and like, did you get invited, right? It was like a big deal. And the beauty of that was that these senior men came, they wouldn't have thought of volunteering themselves, but when they were invited into here this conversation, they were able to, first of all, they were able to hear what's going on with the women. And, but secondly, and I think this is just as important, they were able to create these bonds and relationships with the women in the firm. And they were exposed to the junior women in the firm as well, who they normally would not have really interacted with. So that means, and this is what they found, that um, when it comes time for you know, big assignments, for the, the, the star assignments, when it comes time for promotions, these younger women are now they're known, they're top of mind, and it actually helps with um, bringing them all together. So, so I do think that there, we have to kind of, we, we have to bring in, in both sides here. And when I go and talk to women's groups, I always ask them to invite some men. I'm, I'm speaking tomorrow at, um, there's a, a Women's Power Summit in, in Hollywood. So I'm going to LA um, to talk at this meeting, but, but I am in the one session where it's about men, and we'll be talking with men, and men are invited into the group. Because I feel really strongly like that's, a, that, that, that's where we need to go. And the men are excited to be there. By the way, you, know, you, you spent so much time on this book. You did a ton of research. Um, what surprised you? What, what, what challenged your own assumptions and conclusions? So I, you know, a lot. But I would say one of the, probably one of the top issues that I found as I was doing the research, and there's about 50 pages of research notes in the back. Um, as I was diving into the research, I came across so many of these issues that I, my entire life, have thought they were just me. I thought it was my problem and just me. And I was stunned to find there is, that it is not just me, that it is common to women, it is common to people in underrepresented groups. And um, so I think that was probably the biggest surprise. Um, and then the other part of it on the plus side was it really did change the way I behave as a manager, both in terms of things like being really focused on the people who are not raising their hands um, for a job, um, and also being really focused on who is in the conversation when you're talking about who should get a promotion or who should get a bonus, right? Understanding that we need that diversity of opinion. Being no other questions on the Dory here, uh, 
how has how has the experience of the book impacted you in the sense of the next chapter of your own career? I mean, you know, you 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 achieved great professional success in media organizations, leadership positions. This is a very different uh, role that you're in. Uh, you know, uh, so where do you see this taking you? professionally, personally. Yeah, it's been fascinating. So since the book came out, I've actually been speaking, I've been kind of nonstop um, talking, speaking with, meeting with organizations. And what happened was I started the book three years ago. So this is long before Me Too. Um, and then Me Too happened. And I, the, on the plus side, there is a growing realization among organizations, including very male-dominated organizations like this one, that we haven't done enough, and that there are things that we have tolerated that we shouldn't be tolerating. And there is a lot of soul searching about how do we, what do we do about it? So um, I've been, I've, I've been um, unexpectedly, I expected I would write the book and go on book tour for two weeks, as you, one does with a book. And instead, it's just been sort of endlessly rolling. Um, because there's a lot of interest among these organizations in trying to crack the nut of where do we go next and how do we solve this issue. I will also tell you I have some frustrations in that it's been a year since Me Too, since Harvey Weinstein. Um, and um, there's been a lot of talk, which is great. There has not been enough action. And again, I come back to the, the, um, the walkout today, which I found so inspiring, but what the walkout is doing is, is it is a microcosm, or maybe a macrocosm, of what I am seeing around the country as I talk to companies in other industries who are saying exactly what you guys are saying, which is, OK, we hear you that you're, you're, you're saying the right things, but we need to see action. We need to see movement. And, and that, is not, um, that is not unique to Google, that I am seeing that all over the country and, in fact, um, globally as well. I've been traveling internationally as well, talking about the same issues and seeing the same, the same conversation. Well, I, I, I do hope um, that you know, your thinking uh, and expressions on this um, it can help move that forward further. Obviously, these aren't. This is not likely to be a, a short battle. Um, so I so appreciate um, what you've done, what you've shared. I mean, as I said at the beginning, I think these are just extraordinary, challenging times, divisive times in so many dimensions in our society. And, and uh, you know, far, gender equality, the situation in politics. I, you know, I so believe that like the, the only way we can address divisions is to is to find way to build bridges, is to find way to talk across the divides, find the right language, the right solutions, the right constructive approaches. Um, you know, this has been an interesting and challenging time at Google. I've worked here for nearly ten years, and I've I've always believed, and I do believe that it's a very different company than most. Um, it's a company that cares about principles, uh, that cares about its culture, which doesn't mean it's perfect. Uh, it's not. In fact, it won't ever be. And I think the, we actually always assume that our culture is not perfect. Um, but I do think our only way forward is to, is to engage, to um, challenge each other's uh, perspectives, uh, challenge each other productively, constructively, give them paths to success. Um, uh, rather than just assume failure. There are also some things, and I know we're running out of time, but there are also some things that are very um, specific to technology. Mm -hmm. um, so I will just like, uh, just two quick ones. You know, one is um, just in terms of um, algorithms and who, who's doing the coding, um, whose code is accepted. Uh, you probably know this, but there's been some blind, blind taste tests. So there was one done with GitHub, which has open source coding. Um, and when coding was submitted anonymously, women's code was accepted more often than men's code. So you could conclude that women are better coders. Um, but when names were attached to the code, men's code was accepted at a greater rate than women's code. Uh, there was an engineer at Facebook who did a similar experiment. Who And Facebook disputes this, but this engineer claimed that um, a code written by females at Facebook was 35% less likely to be accepted than code written by men. And then, then the other piece that that works into is your algorithm. So when I, when I go out on the road, I have like a little PowerPoint that when I talk about unconscious bias, I show just Google image searches for various things that, that show partly our unconscious bias. Um, as a, as a, as a you know, one example is while I was writing the book, um, I just did a, a, a search for CEO. 
an image search. And it was all men except for one woman. And the one woman was CEO Barbie. And that is a, it, that reflects our own unconscious bias, but it also is spit out to us by an algorithm, and the algorithms are largely written by men. So you know we have these very ingrained, not intentional, but sort of ingrained issues that I think also are specific to tech. And then one other that I would mention is just simply um, in, in working on the book, I spent time here and I spent time in the Chelsea office in New York. Um, and I loved it and I had a great time, but I come from a male-dominated world. Um, but I noticed that you know, to, to, to go to the cafe in New York, you pass the Lego room, you pass the game room. You know, you're, and, I, and I, at the end, after spending time and, and hearing about all the great things you're doing to try and get to gender balance, I just spoke to a group of women in the New York office. And as, just as we're walking through that office, I said, I see the guys in the game room. I said, do you guys ever go to the game room? And they're like, are you kidding? We want to be taken seriously. We would never do that. And, and it's just these little things. And it, it wasn't like they were complaining about it, but, but it's a very gendered environment. And it just made me wonder, because it really was decorated. I had this sense of deja vu. And I swear to god, I finally realized that the Google office was decorated like the bedroom of my 10-year-old son. And, and it made me wonder, like, what would happen if the Google office were decorated like a stereotypical 10-year-old daughter with purple and pink and fluffy things and glitter guns, right? Like, how would the men feel if that's the environment they worked in every day? So there's these, these uh, you know, there, it's not intentional at all, but it does, it, it, it sort of has an impact on the culture at large and how women feel and how comfortable they feel in the culture. Um, again, uh, thank you hugely for what you've done, for all the work you've done, and for sharing that with us today. And, and uh, uh, I hope we might have a conversation a year from now, two years from now, three years from now, and we might see progress having been made. Fantastic. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you, guys. Thank you.